Greetings and welcome to No BS Baking. We've got JP here now. I've done a number of videos about mixing, but different important aspects of this process are spread out among, the, among a number of the videos. Now, being that mixing and dough development can make or break the finished product, I wanted to create the definitive guide that pulls process and science together to explain the when, what, and whys of mixing process. So without any more delay, let's get at it. The objective of mixing are as follows. Number one, to hydrate the flour. Number two, evenly disperse the ingredients. That's a no-brainer. Incorporate air. Very important. You can find out more about this if you look online. First stage gluten development. Second stage gluten development. All critical parts, and we'll get to these last two a little later in the video. So as we talk about the stages of mixing, I'll go th through each of these using a Farina graph curve to illustrate the process. Now we'll get into the science of the curve a little bit later. The first stage of mixing is usually on number one speed and it's just to get all the ingredients incorporated. Pickup starts when the speed is increased to speed two, where the dough starts to come together. Stage one development is where the dough gets drier and starts forming into a cohesive mass, crossing the 500 line on the chart. Cleanup is the term used to describe a well-formed mass that has basically picked up all of the ingredients and is it's at its maximum stiffness. It's referred to as peak time. Final development is the point between where the dough is the stiffest and the point where it softens enough to drop below the 500 line. This is where the dough gets soft and smooth and extensible and where a window pane check can be done. Letdown is where the dough begins to degrade, dropping below the 500 line. Now, really strong white flour can have a very gradual degradation over a long period. Whereas weaker flours or blends can drop quickly, entering into the breakdown phase rapidly. Now, one thing that makes me crazy, albeit there is many, is the different and often totally contradictory information out there when it comes to mixing. Now, to be honest, after a quick Google search to see what the experts from the baking channels were saying, I had to double take. And for about five seconds there, I thought I had some type of a brain lapse when I saw that text like this are being parroted by so many baking sites and channels. So you have those that say your dough becomes dense, stiff, and difficult to work with, with still others doing silly little experiments that tell all their viewers that you can't overmix. And then, mixed in with all the clutter, you've got the reality check resources that fall totally in line with my experience and schooling. As stated by Bakerpedia, over-mixed doughs become soft, extremely extensible, sticky, and can be weak during proofing. Gluten does not become tighter after extended mixing. It breaks down, often resulting in a loaf that is too weak to hold gas properly, may even collapse in the oven, and often has sharp corners when taken from a pan and has a weak looking open grain to name just a few of the issues. JP, how do you know this for sure? Baking science. Now for those of you who've seen my flour protein video, then you'll recognize the Farina graph curve. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but here is the reality of mixing based on baking science. This curve represents the rheology of the dough during the mixing process. It starts here with all the ingredients where they come together and shortly arrives on the 500 line. And then it hits peak. Peak is when the dough is at its stiffest state. Now we're going to skip MTI with the next most important point on the graph being departure time. Between peak and departure is the time where the dough begins to develop its extensibility and softening creating a nice translucent membrane or the, the old window pane. Now, from arrival to departure reflects the stability time, which is used by bakers to determine optimum mix times for this flour based on their processes. It's important to keep in mind that this dough has no salt added in these tests, so you can quickly see that even without the strengthening effect of, that salt has on gluten, this flour can ride out a total mix time of near 25 minutes with minimal degradation. And even longer, as the curve indicates, only small degradation after this point to pretty much the 35 minute mark. Now, really strong white flour can be hard to overmix to destruction. But what this science does tell you is that the dough does not get stiffer. 
Now I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the folks that promote this information that maybe they're just confusing over mixing with aging due to temperature. Now obviously when you mix a dough for a long time in a mechanical mixer, friction creates heat in the dough. Really long mixing can heat the dough to temperatures where yeast is getting rocking and fermentation begins to kick off aggressively due to the temperature rise. As the dough ages, due to the temperature, it can start feeling a puffy and stiffer and it breaks apart when checking for a window pane. Now this is not the same as, as over mixing. This is too warm of a dough. Now as I mentioned in my videos, I like cool to cold water when baking bread. Cooler dough with, a good, with good development just means maybe 15 minutes longer proof. Too warm of a dough all the way around can be a nightmare. Now I'm not going to beat this to death too much because I've covered this stuff off in my flour protein in my mixing videos. However, remember, as white flour decreases in your recipe, so does your mix times. As the protein content of your flour decreases, say you go from a nice strong bread flour to an all-purpose, mix times are reduced. As you dilute your flour with non-gluten uh, flours or powder additives, mix times come down. As the quantity of coarse ingredients goes up, including whole wheat flour, mix times are reduced. As you shift away from white flour opting for rye bread or breads made from ancient wheats, it's important to remember that although these flours can boast very high protein levels, they're often low in gluten forming protein, requiring very little mixing. Mixing is about developing the gluten in dough. In many modern bakeries, gluten is developed and conditioned in the mixing stage with the help of often natural derived reducing agents. For most of us home bakers, we rely on time or rest periods for conditioning. By applying the right amount of rest time for the dough, home bakers can cover up shortfalls with respect to undermixing, which seems a common theme for many of the demonstrations I have watched. If we quickly compare a strong curve on the left to say an AP flour, we can see the difference in mix times and potential rest times required just based on these curves. Now once again these curves are generated with no salt in the dough and as we know salt strengthens and tightens gluten which would extend these curves out significantly. The W index is most commonly associated with durum wheat flour. However, many places in Europe use this rating system to include traditional flour. The W index is an indication of flour strength, usually associated with pizza dough and pasta production. However, it's also used as an indicator of strength for bread flour in numerous parts of the world. So if you find a nice zero zero flour you want to try and you see this W thing, you know what it means. Regardless of which system you use, most bakers will agree that for long fermentation doughs, the higher the protein, the better. Yet many may leave this important information out of their online demonstrations. To better illustrate this, let's take a look at our curve again. So you can see that with this strong hard wheat bread flour curve, the arrival time to peak is around 10 minutes. This is when the flour and the water are at their most viscous and the dough is at its toughest state. The next part between peak and departure is the softening part of the process, making the dough more elastic and pliable for achieving a window pane. In the case of no-time dough, this is achieved through the use of reducing agents and mechanical mixing to a point where a window pane is fully developed. For most home bakers, this softening is achieved through the combination of both mixing and rest time or overnight fermentation to allow the dough to double in size. This time conditions the gluten in lieu of mixing, developing the extensibility, softening, and gas retention capability. The effects of rest times on gluten can be demonstrated no better than in the case of no-knead breads. The lack of mechanical mixing or kneading in the first critical stages are a direct result of why these products often fall short of properly developed and processed bread products. So a quick note, try not to beat these curves to death, but you can see a perfect example by looking at these as why long fermentation and rest times can work with some flours and not so well with others. Here you have a long, stable and gradual drop from the 500 line showing that this flour will stand up well to extended enzymatic and bacterial conditioning. 
while the curve on the right shows a more downward and rapid plunge that translates into much faster degradation of the gluten structure. The less gluten in your flour or dough, the faster and steeper the decline as demonstrated here with this curve that could be like a pastry flour or even a high protein but low gluten flour such as rye or ancient grains. So I want to be clear that near all low protein flours or doughs with lots of grains and other goodies in them are always mixed less than standard white doughs. With this in mind, there are many heavy breads and ethnic specialties that bakers may provide long fermentation to to bring out the flavors and the characteristics appropriate for the product. That being said, in most instances where overnight or longer fermentation is required in a low gluten protein product, they're often barely mixed if at all. Volume is often not a major objective with some products leaning more to creating flavors and textures desired. As an example, Many heavy rye breads are built around dough mass and scaling weights versus worry too much about rise or oven spring. So for determining the best mixing plan, you need to think about the gluten protein in your flour. Now most white bread flour protein declarations are mostly gluten forming proteins. The other thing is how much rest time are you planning? Less resting, more mixing as a rule. Longer resting, less mixing that may be required. No matter whether you're making no time dough with all the conditioning done actually during the mixing process, or you decided to rest it on your counter for an hour or to let it soften and develop, or even if you opted for an overnight in the refrigerator to get the dough to develop those wonderful flavors and beautifully conditioned, conditioned texture for final shaping, the window pane test is an excellent indication of the readiness and proof and bake performance you should expect. Before I wrap this video up, I want to leave you with some basic guidelines. Now these are general starting points based on say 60 to 65 percent water in your dough, final dough temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius max, no dough conditioners, one double in size rest period and punch back either at room temperature on the bench or overnight refrigerated proof, doesn't matter and there's 2% salt in the dough. Now keep in mind, I don't know your flour. I mean, is your whole wheat flour coarse meal or fine milled? Are your grains you are adding soaked or not? Is your high protein flour a quality hard spring wheat or a blend of hard and soft? And it just goes on from there. Now these mixed times are based on my experience and seemingly hold true amongst the professional baking community as good general guidelines. When making doughs with high butterfat content, say around 10% or higher, many bakers will recommend delaying the addition of the fat until the dough has been mixed for a while. High levels of fat lubricate the dough and the mixing bowl, reducing the effects of the mixing action. When to do, how much to do, and how is the best to do is based on the recipe and the processing plan. The old delay the salt trick. Now this technique comes up from time to time and generally is used as an example after you auto lease or to reduce mix times by de developing the dough a bit before adding the salt. Personally, unless you've got a specific purpose on why you're doing this, throw your salt all in there. Don't uh, get into any of this stuff or next thing you know, you forgot your salt and you end up having headaches. Professional bakers often use reducing agents, especially with strong flour and a need for productivity or faster processing from floor to bag. As we discussed in the video, strong flours often cannot be optimized without providing time or mechanical action to condition them to optimum. Now, I don't want to get into this too much, but I recommend you check out this video where I get into it in detail. The overnight bulk fermentation is one of my favorite recommendations when dealing with strong flours or when I want to cheat a bit on my actual mixing stage. Now accessories matter. On the home baking side there are many contraptions and attachments equipment suppliers say can mix bread dough. Well how well do they do this is all over the place. Even a standard dough hook set up on a cheaper kitchen mixer may not do the job efficiently or properly. Always best to do your research. Read a few reviews when purchasing a multi-purpose mixer for bread making. 
generally mixing speeds for the various stuff that you may be making are recommended by the manufacturer. Good equipment will perform as it should in generally the times provided. Or cheap mixers, well, you get what you pay for. Remember, there's at least two speeds for bread dough, low to incorporate the ingredients, and another speed to develop the dough. As a general rule, higher hydration doughs require less mix time than stiffer doughs. So, good to keep this in mind. And lastly, anything that is coarse in, in texture that you add to your dough, like coarse salts, hard grains, bran, etc., this will have a shearing and damaging effect on your gluten structure. So, be aware of this and be cognizant of your mix time.